you very much for having me. Um, so my name is Alex, I'm based at Bond University uh, and my role is basically to automate systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Um, <laughs> so how did I get into this? Um, I was doing a PhD in neuroscience uh, and wanted to do a systematic review of the biomedical literature describing animal models of depression. Um, whenever you search it on PubMed, there is about 78,000 results, uh, and that's just from one database. So um, if you're anything like me, oh, way too many studies. Um, <laughs> so I immediately thought as that's not doable. It's not doable in a five year research project, uh, and they essentially don't give money for research projects longer than five years. So what kind of tools can we uh, find, use, develop, um, to reduce some of this burden associated with um, lots and lots of literature being published. Um, so then I then used some of the findings from my systematic review to translate those um, into what I originally wanted to do is improve the, the animal model literature. Um, and also as a side note, I am an avid uh, open science and open access uh, advocate. So I'm part of the um, Australian New Zealand um, Open Research Network. <coughs> So what is a systematic review? A systematic review is a structured process to identify all of the data relevant to a specific research question. Uh, and it may be followed by a meta-analysis, which I don't need to tell you guys, is a statistical process um, providing summary estimates for the outcomes. <clears throat> but they're very, very time consuming. So more and more literature um, is just uh, being published uh, and people, uh, me and, and colleagues and everyone who's tried to do uh, some form of review or systematic review um, has faced this issue. Um, but we shouldn't stop there. Systematic reviews are actually a really good tool. Uh, they provide an unbiased overview of all of the available literature. Um, you can identify knowledge gaps um, to generate new uh, research questions. Uh, critically appraise the study quality, uh, which is very important, um, especially in this day and age of the reproducibility crisis. Um, and using meta-analysis to identify factors that influence um, effects that we see. <clears throat> and of course, inform the experimental design uh, of new studies and reduce waste uh, in future research. But it takes a really, really long time. Like I said, um, uh, Lau in the recent edition, um, special edition of systematic reviews um, on automation uh, techniques, uh, Joseph Lau estimated that if you retrieve about 10,000 uh, unique citations, uh, that it costs upward of 300,000 uh, US dollars to conduct. Uh, so it's a very, very time consuming research process. So basically, the more and more research that gets published and indexed in PubMed, uh, the more we have to synthesize, uh, and then your desktop might look like this. <laughs> um, but we are scientists, we do want to uh, find the truth uh, and uh, meta-analysis, systematic review and meta-analysis is a great way um, to find the overall effect uh, of an intervention, for example. Um, but we can use automation tools to get slightly faster to the top of that mountain. <laughs> so that's what my talk today is about. Uh, it's about what automation tools that we currently have in our toolbox. So along the uh, systematic review process of systematic searching, uh, screening your, your articles for, for relevance uh, and potentially categorizing them into various drugs, uh, extracting the data uh, and analyzing the data um, at the end. So yeah, this, I'm gonna go through a couple of different um, techniques um, that, we, that we have available right now. Um, so what do we mean by an automation tool? Uh, many people actually ask me this. Uh, it's basically any computer tool or software that can fully or semi-automate um, any of the systematic review research tasks. Um, so yeah, it can be a tool for a single task uh, and it can also be a platform or a software that helps you perform multiple steps um, in the systematic review process. Um, so, Basically, all of my research is about how we can uh, reduce the burden of evidence synthesis uh, research. So this is a slightly um, more in-depth breakdown of the steps of a systematic review. 
Um, so today I'm going to be covering um, tools that um, help you with the uh, search strategy, the study selection, data extraction, uh, quality appraisal, um, oh sorry that should be highlighted as well, the meta-analysis and the publication step. So yeah, some of the tools I'm going to be covering are um, the Polyglot um, Search Translator, the deduplication algorithm, um, SRA EndNote Helper, um, various, like briefly various different site review platforms, um, custom machine learning algorithms for um, citation screening, um, text mining, some basic keyword dictionaries that can help you with data extraction, um, risk of bias um, using text mining, uh, and things like webplot digitizer and stat check for um, assessing the statistical robustness um, and uh, red man replicant as well sorry i'm missing there should be one uh, a shiny app for the meta analysis at that stage so uh, first up the search strategy um, at this stage you often have to search um, not just PubMed or um, CINAHL or your database of choice, but for a, um, for a systematic review to, to gain all of the evidence on a specific topic, you usually search multiple databases. Um, and not all databases are created equal. Um, there are different kind of syntaxes and different rules and different regulations for searching um, each of those databases, um, which is uh, a pain. <laughs> um, so at Bond, we built the Polyglot Search Translator, um, which basically takes your PubMed or your um, Medline search um, and translates that into um, Embase, Sinal, uh, Cochrane, PsycInfo, Web of Science, etc. Um, and like you can see here, you just input your, your search here and just click the various uh, which, whichever um, database you like it, then you can just copy paste that directly into the um, into the uh, the web browser um, into your into your uh, database and retrieve those studies. So um, that's a really neat tool, um, and it has saved uh, health librarians and those of us not fortunate to have health librarians in our team. Um, <laughs> saves a lot of time. Uh, we tested um, it versus manual translations, so getting expert librarians to uh, manually uh, translate the syntax and the brackets and the different uh, mesh headings and things like that. Um, and it saves about 10 minutes uh, per database searched, and for some of the more complex searches it can save up to 100 minutes. Um, and also it reduces errors, which is great, so that's one of the things that can also um, make the translation process really annoying, you've missed like encoding, you've missed one comma, like, um, so yeah. Really neat tool, and we just launched our um, version uh, three, so that's live on the um, CREB website, on the uh, SR Accelerator website, for free, free of charge. Um, so after you've searched uh, your multiple databases, you need to um, deduplicate those findings um, to make sure that you're left with only the unique citations. <clears throat> so one of the tools that we built was um, the uh, SRA deduplicator. Um, so it basically takes uh, an EndNote library, um, runs uh, basically a, a simple uh, algorithm. It first checks for the field comparisons, um, then it converts uh, common um, things, common reasons why um, uh, duplications are not found by converting page numbers, uh, then it matches by uh, author and title, and then it uses um, fuzzy logic to uh, match uh, names. And at the end, you're left with an endnote library of the unique citations that you can take away. You can do this process in EndNote, but we know that it's not, um, it's not as, um, sensitive and specific as we'd like. Um, so yeah, we just tested it against uh, EndNote and um, the SRO uh, deduplicator has 100% specificity um, and 84% sensitivity. So uh, this is a slight increase um, to using just EndNote, um, but yeah, all of our tools are available free um, online. And if you have more than 2000 citations, you can download the desktop version uh, free of charge. 
So now you're ready to screen your citations. Are they actually relevant to your research question or not? Um, which, is, which is great. Let's, let's get started. Uh, there are a number of different tools that can help you um, and softwares. So um, the, at, the, um, at Bond, we've got a, um, if you like using EndNote, we've got an EndNote hotkey helper called SRA Helper. Um, there are platforms such as um, Rayan and Providence. Um, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about the systematic review facility um, that we built at my previous team uh, at Canaries in Edinburgh. Um, and for larger systematic reviews, retrieving more than about 10,000 studies, um, machine learning algorithms can really help. So I'll be talking about um, some custom algorithms. So um, SURF, the platform, um, was initially funded by the National Centre for um, 3Rs, so refinement, uh, replacement and reduction of um, animals. Um, and it's a great platform basically to conduct lots of steps of your systematic review. You can collate your studies, you can have as many users as you want um, contributing to your study at each stage, um, and, it's, and it's free to use. Um, very um, adaptable and amenable to um, exactly the types of things that you want to do for your review. So this is really great for, for crowd screening. Um, so for especially larger systematic reviews where you maybe have 5,000, 10,000 citations, or if you um, maybe as a statistical society interested in a specific domain, you guys can all log in at the same time and do the screening um, simultaneously. So it basically uh, presents randomly uh, the next uh, citation, you screen it and it uh, only uh, is removed from the citation pool um, when it has two, um, I guess, concurrent decisions. So two people have included it or two people have excluded it. If there are two reviewers that look um, at an article um, and they disagree, it automatically gets sent to for a third reviewer. Um, so it's a really cool tool for, um, for crowd screening. Um, you can basically, it's free to join, you go, go ahead and register your project. <clears throat> uh, and like you can see, there's um, many, uh, you can have many, many different users on it. Um, and this is what it looks like um, when you've uploaded your um, EndNote library or a simple um, tab separated um, document. You've got your uh, You've got your inclusion and exclusion criteria here on the side, uh, your title um, and your authors and your abstract. And you simply select uh, include and exclude, uh, or if you don't fancy doing this article just now, you can just skip it. So yeah, that's great if you've got a couple of citations, uh, hundreds or maybe a thousand, and you've got a couple of you working on the project, um, but, as we're seeing and as we're facing, increasingly there's more and more citations. So um, the average systematic review has about, I think, 11,000 uh, unique um, citations retrieved at the screening stage. Um, so machine learning is becoming uh, a tool that is used uh, quite frequently. Um, so over the next couple of slides, I'll just go through um, how, it, how it works, basically, um, how it's been used um, for um, identifying whether an article is a randomized control trial or not. Um, then I'll go through um, some of the custom algorithm uh, applications, how it performed, uh, and how um, we used the algorithm to help us identify um, human screening errors. So uh, just uh, a note, I'm not a <laughs> machine learning expert, um, but uh, I will do my best to give a general overview of how it works. So um, you've got some uh, training documents. Um, where you've used your reviewer group to screen them and label them. Um, so we would assign, uh, well, we would want a gold standard set of um, citations. Um, so that in smart review world, that means having two independent reviewers make a decision um, and either a third person adjudicate or um, some sort of discussion. Um, these then get um, converted from as text into uh, feature vectors using feature selection, um, which is a difficult process. Um, it involves a lot of tweaking. Um, and the next, those um, features.
feature vectors are used to train a machine learning uh, algorithm uh, along with the labels. So it associates the, the vectors with um, either an include or an exclude um, decision. So the features from the documents um, help the algorithm decide whether um, an article is relevant or not. Um, so the most commonly used uh, algorithm in um, citation screening or evidence synthesis is um, the support vector machine. Um, and then it just uh, applies that algorithm that's, that it's learned to new documents that it sees. <clears throat> A really, really cool. Um, so I'll just go over um, how it can be used for, for RCTs. Uh, and I'm hoping to give a little demo. So this is built by um, Ian Marshall and Byron Wallace. Um, Ian Marshall is based at UCL in London, um, and Byron Wallace is a um, super cool machine learning dude from the University of Texas. He's like trying to do convolutional neural networks and all kinds of stuff. Um, so it basically takes uh, like your standard um, PubMed or Embase file um, and outputs, um, again, a standard um, PubMed or Embase file, but only with the RCTs. Yeah. So um, just at that link, it's free to use. Um, choose the file. Oh no. Hopefully there's faster internet that and then, then down at Bond. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> So yeah, that's a great tool to use um, if your internet is a bit faster. <laughs> so how did they um, actually create this algorithm? Um, they trained it on um, using the Cochrane Crowd, which is a new initiative in Cochrane where um, citizen scientists um, and any member of the Cochrane community can uh, basically this crowd approach of screening um, citations as to whether it's an RCT or not. Um, the crowd receives some sort of training. Um, so we know that they have understood to a minimum level of what an RCT is. Yeah, was that a question? Use the abstract. Yes, it uses the title and the abstract um, of the citations that you've received from PubMed. Um, and yeah, it just identifies um, using a feature selection. Yeah. So um, they trained it on 22,000 uh, RCTs um, and they validated it on the um, quite famous clinical hedges um, data set, which was uh, 49,000 articles. Um, so yeah, if you use it on maximum sensitivity, you're basically guaranteed that um, it's not missed any RCTs, um, but with a specificity of 87%, um, there might be some articles in there that aren't RCTs. Uh, but what it's done is it's gone ahead and filtered out lots and lots of studies that aren't an RCT. So if your um, research question is, is looking at RCTs, then that's a, that's a great way. Um, so yeah, Cochrane uses this a lot. <clears throat> so if you're uh, not a Cochrane person or you're not interested in RCTs, um, but you do have a large data set, then you can train your own custom um, uh, machine learning algorithm. Uh, and that's what we did um, at Camarades. We teamed up with the National Centre for Text Mining uh, in Manchester in the UK and uh, Epicenter James Thomas um, down at UCL. <clears throat> and um, Rayan, actually, um, the free to use um, citation screening software, also has some active learning um, in, in their software as well. Um, but I think. They don't have very many validation um, publications out yet. So um, I had about 70,000 potentially relevant articles um, for 
uh, animal models of depression. Uh, I took a random subset of those and trained them using a crowd approach. Um, we had um, uh, yeah, just under 6,000 records and that, we, that comprised of the training set, the articles that we we're going to use to train the algorithm. Uh, and then we had uh, yeah, 1,250 um, just so that we could check how the machine was performing. <clears throat> Um, we then trained um, several different algorithms, um, but the one that came out tops was the um, support vector machine. Um, and then used that to identify the relevant studies. We were really, really happy with the um, performance um, because it, uh, it achieved a 98% sensitivity uh, and 86% sensitivity. Uh, and like I said, with a linear support vector um, and um, bag of words uh, feature selection. So not even that fancy. Um, I think we used trigrams, so yeah. Um, we were very happy with that. Um, and our gold standard, um, you know, the reason why we have in Systematic Reviews two independent reviewers um, review each article is trying to try and reduce that human error. Um, so we estimate that even with two human reviewers that our sensitivity is about 95%. Um, so yeah, we were interested to find out if we could actually use the algorithm to help us improve, um, improve that gold standard. Um, so what we did was we um, took the training set, which was the set of articles that had a um, human reviewer decision, um, and we used a technique called K-fold validation, which I've been told is really, really often used in the machine learning world, um, but we had no idea and we thought it was really cool. Um, so basically what it does is it divides um, your art group of articles into a K number of uh, groups. Uh, we had five. Um, and then what it does is it just takes one of those groups away. You then train the algorithm uh, using the other subsets of articles and then give the, um, that, that little subset that's been taken away, you give them a machine score. Um, and you do that for each, um, you do that for each group of articles. Um, and then what you're left with is um, basically the human decisions along with the machine decisions. Um, so then you can highlight any discrepancies between whether the human thinks it's included and the machine thinks it's um, ex uh, included or excluded. Um, so that was really neat. Um, and it actually improved, uh, when we went back and corrected the errors, um, it actually improved our sensitivity of the original machine learning algorithm um, by, by um, two and a half percent. Um, so that might not um, seem like a lot, two and a half percent, but if you're dealing with something like 70,000 articles, that's a lot less citations that you have to screen or that need to see human eyes. So um, using this technique, we um, got the 70,000 articles down to about 18,000, which was uh, an amazing reduction uh, in time. I think it saved about uh, 49 person months. So, yeah. So 18,000 is still a lot to go and then extract the data from uh, and if anyone has done a systematic review or knows the data extraction process it can be long and timely. Um, <laughs> so if you've got some documents you can uh, annotate them uh, and group them using some machine learning, uh, sorry, some text mining techniques um, which I thought were really cool so I tried them out. Um, so basically, nothing that fancy. Um, I basically just built some uh, regular expression dictionaries. Um, what is a regular expression? Uh, it's basically a keyword, but on steroids. Um, so it looks something like, uh, like that up there. That basically matches um, color with a capital or a lowercase. It also matches the American and the um, British spelling, uh, and it has, um, with the with the S, so it's basically a more efficient way of searching through lots and lots of text. So um, I built some dictionaries for um, in uh, psychiatry, um, different type of antidepressant drugs, <clears throat> um, the mode that a drug is delivered, um, which is uh, really interesting to to group the articles by, and, and something that you might want to investigate um, as a source of heterogeneity in your data set. And also, more specifically, um, for my research, which animal model of depression they were using. Uh, and I developed these, um, 
these dictionaries while I was doing a fellowship for Content Mine, which is a, um, a not-for-profit company um, that work with Wikimedia um, and Wikipedia um, to basically harvest facts from the literature. So that was very cool. Um, what happens when you um, run all your um, data set through these regular expression dictionaries? Um, you can count the frequency um, and the occurrence of your terms of interest, um, and you can basically visualize your data set uh, in a really, really nice way. Um, so this is called a tree map plot, um, and I'll just use this mouse. So basically, the area of the drug is proportional to the number of documents that it appears in, so SSRIs are very popular. Um, and the color or the intensity of the color refers to the average frequency per document. So this is quite interesting for things like ketamine, where um, ketamine is an anesthetic, but it's also being investigated as an antidepressant. So if it's used as an anesthetic, it might only be mentioned once per document. However, if it's the main intervention, it will be mentioned lots and lots of times. Um, so how have we used um, this uh, text mining approach? Um, for basically categorizing and grouping documents. Um, I built this into a Shiny app um, and I had uh, lots and lots of students who were interested in helping me out. They could basically go themselves, select the drug that they were interested in and download the data set and go ahead and start their data extraction, um, which is really, really useful for prioritizing that data extraction stage um, and also extracting um, the keywords from, from documents. Um, you can basically build anything with the regular expression dictionaries you can build anything you want um, if you have a set list of terms that you're interested in so um, another bottleneck i would say in the research process is um, extracting data from uh, graphs um, and there is a really great tool called um, web plot digitizer that is also free to use um, where you basically upload your um, PDFs, um, you select what the um, axes mean, literally click four times, um, and then you can just go and select each of these points um, and it'll put it into a format that you can um, copy paste uh, either into an Excel. I think also you are able to export it um, as a CSV. Um, so yeah, um, Fala Cramond and other researchers down um, at UCL, our collaborators, um, have integrated this into a user interface um, and it saves about five minutes per graph. Um, so in biomedical sciences, and if you've ever read a nature paper, there's about 25 graphs. Um, <laughs> so five minutes per graph is, uh, is a great um, time saving, um, but also it improves accuracy. So um, as with citation screening, data extraction um, to have a high quality is also done in duplicate. Um, and one of the very time consuming processes is um, reconciling any differences. So when we've improved the accuracy of this data extraction process, we can also reduce time spent at that next step. Um, so another tool is um, StatCheck, which is built by Michelle Nugent in um, the Netherlands. Um, they came over to meet Brian Nosek in Melbourne uh, in April. Um, they're very cool people. Uh, the Dutch always are very cool. Um, she um, just built this during her PhD. As it was um, basically, it um, takes a uh, like PDF um, in APA format, so they're in psychology, so they have a standard format for reporting statistics. So, you know, you do report your F value and your degrees of freedom, as well as your P value. Um, sometimes in medicine, people are a little bit sloppy and only report a P value. P is less than 0.05, does my head in. Um, <laughs> but basically, it goes through all of the um, PDF, finds those. Um, finds those instances of correct statistical reporting and then reruns based on the degrees of freedom and the F value to see whether the P value reported is correct. Um, yeah, so you get a list of um, the reported P value and then you get what the actual P value is. Um, and it's really interesting. Um, Michelle uh, actually ran her own PhD through this and found, <laughs> found like five or six errors. Um, so yeah. Uh, really, really interesting tool um, and great if you're trying to extract um, statistical reporting uh, information, also free to use. 
So the next step uh, in the systematic review process, um, and arguably one of the most important, um, is assessing the studies that you've included um, for their quality. Um, and in different fields, there are a number of different kind of set checklists that you can use. Um, and that's usually, again, done manually. Um, so we were interested at Camarades in how we can speed up this process because it takes such a long time. <laughs> um, so basically, we also created a uh, risk and bias um, regex dictionary. Um, this was built by Jeanette Bahal, um at Camarades. Um, the Landis criteria are one of the key uh, landmark criteria um, for minimum report, uh, minimum uh, measures to reduce the risk of bias in an experiment, uh, randomization, blinding, and reporting of the sample size calculation. Um, so Jeanette went through lots and lots of literature and identified uh, many different ways that people have reported this, um, like allocation concealment and blind assessment of outcome, et cetera, et cetera. Um, using, again, the same crowd approach um, and turned these wordings into a regex dictionary. <clears throat> Um, so this tool takes um, a CSV um, and processes um, it using, um, basically takes the full text PDFs, converts them uh, to text, and then checks um, each of the full text articles against those um, dictionary entries, the randomization, blind, and sum size calculation, um, and returns true or false. Um, so we tested this um, in uh, animal models of stroke um, and against the gold standard of human reviewers. Um, the uh, randomization, 100% uh, sensitivity, and that's never a thing, um, with 67% um, specificity, so it seems to be kind of over, over excited. Um, the, the blinding um, dictionary entry um, performed really, really well. Uh, and the sample size calculation one still needs some work. Um, it's just very, very, sample size calculations are very rarely reported in the published literature. So it's hard to understand how people um, word it. Um, and Shen Yun Wang is currently um, working at Camarades to improve these um, using kind of distant supervised um, learning algorithms um, and updating the dictionary. Um, if you work with um, clinical trials, um, then you are in luck. There is a very, very nice um, tool also built by Ian Marshall and Byron Wallace that um, does this for you um, based on, again, uh, Cochrane um, clinical trial data sets. Um, so basically what they did was they um, found the um, Cochrane um, database of systematic reviews and found the um, clinical trials that were reported in these um, systematic reviews. And in a Cochrane review, you need to extract the exact phrasing um, that, uh, that the primary articles use in order to justify your risk of bias decision. So they had uh, some unannotated uh, full text articles and they just kind of, in a distant supervised way, just kind of matched them up and linked them. Um, and then they trained the algorithm to try and find those, um, those phrases. Um, and they did actually end up, they think they tried convolutional neural networks, but they ended up using um, an SVM algorithm as well. Um, so um, that's available also for free um, at robotreviewer.net. You basically upload your um, PDF um, and it goes and gives you one of these very nice Cochrane uh, risk of bias tables, a traffic light table. Um, green is if it's low risk of bias, uh, orange is um, unclear, um, and red is high risk of bias. Um, and amongst other things, it goes through and also tries to identify um, the PICO, the um, participants, the intervention, the comparator group, and the outcomes. Um, so yeah, it's a really neat tool. Um, so it was validated um, in, so they trained it on articles um, that were included in systematic reviews, and they validated it on clinical trials that were included in more than two or more systematic reviews. So they basically compared different groups of human reviewers against each other um, to validate it. <clears throat> and it performs not as well as the human, so you still need some human interaction um, for this step. But it's really, really useful, um, and the user interface is really nice to 
um, extract those key sentences and find where those sentences are located in the PDF. So I recommend that you that you check it out. So uh, next, after you've collected all of your data, it's lots of hard work to uh, extract them from the PDFs, uh, and you're ready to uh, meta-analyze your data. Um, so um, at Camarades, um, Shenying Wang um, built an amazing shiny app um, that I will see if I can demo for you. So this tool takes um, a CSV file um, with pre-specified um, headings. There is a user guide um, available on GitHub so that you can name your uh, headings correctly. And it's basically a um, shiny app that just, uh, an in R that just uses the code um, that you would usually type into, so a metaphor package. Um, but just makes it really, really easy for users to use um, without any programming experience. So you can choose your um, effect size measure, you can choose meta regression or, or stratified, you can select the heterogeneity estimator. Um, and basically, I mean, tell it whether your, your data are pre nested or not. Um, and yeah, it just runs it for you. Um, you can just copy paste this directly into the results section uh, and download the forest plot, adjust the width and adjust the colors to however you like it. Um, this tool is optimized for using with SURF, so it um, directly matches up with the um, data extraction output that you get from SURF. So, um, but if you want to use it for anything else, you can just use the user guide and make sure that your headings match. Um, so yeah, you can do your trim and fill. Really, really cool. Shenyang is an actual genius. <laughs> she was doing a um, master's with us. Um, she, um, very, very quiet um, demeanor, and she just kind of quietly one day came and said, oh, I've made this thing. Do you want to have a look? And we were like, yeah, yeah, what is it? And she's like, you know, you know, surf, you know, this is a review platform. She's like, yeah, I built a tool that can do something with the meta analysis. I was like, oh, and we were all like, yeah, yeah, okay, getting around the computer. And then she showed us this app, and we were like, wow, that is amazing. Um, so, yeah, the code is on GitHub. You can run it locally, um, or you can run it on the Camarado Shiny. <clears throat> this was just in case that the demo doesn't work. So, lastly, done your meta analysis. You've got all your information, and now you just need to write it up for publication. Um, this can also be automated, <laughs> um, or we're trying to help people, um, because usually the kind of mental fatigue, once you've reached that stage, you can almost, oh, you know, you don't have any mental energy left to, to interpret your results, and that's really where we as scientists should be, should be in our forte, um, but, you know, if you've been doing this review for three years, and you're sick to death of the files then <laughs> writing it up can be um yeah it can be challenging um so at bond we built a um tool that takes a revman file so revman is also free to use meta-analysis software and um, often used with um, clinical data and um, cochrane reviews and you basically upload your meta-analysis file from revman and it generates sentences um that suggests, it suggests your sentences um, for you. So I think there's a little demo. Um, it's a cool tool, um, but the video is about a minute long. So I'll see, it's much easier than me explaining badly. Is there sound on this, do we know? I'll give it a go. Oh, I might be able to actually just demo it.
I'll just demo it live with the text as well. Yeah, come on. Um. So this is the Testnet Review Accelerator tool and um, toolkit that we built at Bond, um, and it's just it's free to make a user. Um, the Redman replicant is. Um, available along here and then let me see if I have a file that works. If the location could reading my USB stick. There we go. Thank you for your patience. Uh, oh, I don't even have this thing. I don't even have a Redman file. I don't know it's all. Sorry about that. I don't have a file that I can actually demo it with, with me. It's really irritating that that video doesn't work. Anyway, the slides are on um, Open Science Framework, and um, you can just click the link. It's just tiny URL um, slash SRA replicant. Um, it basically gives you um, about seven to ten different sentence generations for each of your um, uh, outcomes, uh, each of your comparisons. Um, but what it does is it um, it reduces the error associated with reporting your meta-analysis. So because it's um, taken the numbers, the number of studies, the number of um, the heterogeneity, the I squared, the p-values, um, it takes those directly from the Redman file. Um, it, it reduces that kind of human error that you make when you're, you know, you've got several files when you're trying to write up your results um, and gives you a really good starting um, place. Um, obviously, you don't need to use those randomly generated sentences if you don't want. Um, but as we all know, it's much easier to edit than it is to um, write from scratch. Um, so yeah, that's a, a cool tool. And what we're currently working on is um, working with our collaborators in Hong Kong um, and Epistemonikos, uh, a group in South America, um, to um, get language translations. So basically, because it's a, it's a very structured process, it's really, really easy to, um, to translate so that our collaborators all over the world can use this. <clears throat> oh, you've written up your results. You've done this smart review in your meta-analysis. <laughs> so some of the tools that I've covered today um, are um, Polyglot for translating your search strategies across databases. Um, the deduplication algorithm, um, which you can use um, in addition to EndNote and um, be left with the unique citations. Um, custom algorithms uh, and systematic review platforms for screening citations for, um, uh, for inclusion. Um, uh, EndNote helper um, to help you retrieve your full text PDFs. Um, custom keyword dictionaries and risk of bias dictionaries. Um, a web plot digitizer and stat check to help you extract uh, data from graphs uh, and statistical data, uh, and Redman Replicant. Um, so these are just some of the tools that are available. Um, I would highly recommend going to um, Systematic Review Toolbox. Um, built, uh, this is basically a database of the, the current uh, automation tools available for systematic review, um, built by Chris Marshall and Anthea Sutton. Um, so that's a really, really good resource. Uh, there's also a R consortium of people that are interested in, uh, in meta research. Um, and more recently, um, I attended the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon down in um, Canberra in April. Um, and 
one of the results of that hackathon was a group of people that got together and basically integrating all of the R tools into one big um, shiny package. So basically they wanted Tidyverse, but for uh, meta, um, meta analysis and statistics as well as screening um, and things like that. So um, uh, they recently got funded, I think $50,000 from the R consortium to set up that project. So um, that's really cool. Um, so some of the things that I've learned uh, from integrating these tools into uh, my review uh, and uh, people come to me and ask, oh, how do I use this tool, blah, blah, um, into many different types of reviews, um, animal, uh, environmental, toxicology, um, clinical, etc. Uh, the first thing is to consider um, the size of your review. How many citations are you likely to retrieve um, at the search stage? Um, doing kind of some pilot searching really, really helps um, to see what kind of tools that you might want to use along the way. If you've got 20,000 studies, you might want to already now at the protocol development stage and the search strategy stage um, get in touch with um, a team that can help um, with that. But if you've only got uh, maybe 500 studies, then using um, platforms like RAM um, or SysRev or um, Covidence for clinical studies um, can help you um, just make that, um, that screening process a little bit easier. Uh, another thing is to consider, um, as you do with your protocol, how you're going to use your methodology, um, which tools that you want to use at which stage. Um, and what levels of performance. So um, some tools semi-automate the research process, um, other tools um, other tools fully, fully automate it. Um, so yeah, which levels of performance are you going to accept in your review? Uh, and as with everything really, really good uh, practice to pre-specify this. Um, and recommendations, if there's no tool available, make one. Uh, that's literally what I did. <laughs> um, and it's actually proved really useful. Um, and if you have any questions, um, often contact the tool developer. Um, the, it's usually another academic sitting in another office that's like, oh, yay, someone's using my tool. Um, and if you have any feedback or you're interested in working with them to adapt the tool, um, my experience um, in the international collaboration of Cisno reviews, as most people are um, very, very receptive to collaboration. Um, and always remember to cite the person who made the tool. Um, and yeah, again, good for um, transparency and reproducibility. So um, these tools are um, being used wide scale. Um, so this was a review of. Um, animal models of chemotherapy-induced uh, peripheral neuropathy, uh, not my biological area. Um, and they used, they had done a CISNOT review in 2012 um, and had all of that uh, screening, uh, the citation screening um, data, and they wanted to then update it again. Um, so they basically used the training data that they had already done by hand to train a machine learning algorithm to sort through the new um, studies that have come up. So if you... Um, are in a research group and you're interested in a specific area and you're always interested in, in the new literature, it's, it's actually worth training an algorithm if you're going to be in this field for, for 10 years. Um, another um, approach using um, the SURF platform is um, a team in, uh, at Imperial College. Um, so Nadia Solomon and is interested in um, cannabis uh, for pain um, and basically she's recruited I think about 30 or 40 people worldwide just using Twitter and using um, some society newsletters um, to basically do um, her entire review using a crowdsourced approach um, because she doesn't have any other members, uh, she doesn't have an RA or any other members in her lab, um, she basically is getting other people to help her do her review which is amazing. Um, and at Bond, we have um, been developing these tools for, for a number of years. Um, and we're, I mean, the usage is great. Um, for, for the past five months, the average, we've got about 700 uh, new users um, per month. Um, so that's, that's great. Um, really, really helpful. All the tools are free to use and there's help guides and documentation available. It's all on GitHub as well um, with a standard MIT license. So. Um, and yeah, if you are uh, interested in using any of these tools, um, do get in touch. 
Um, we actively build new tools um, and our, one of our new projects is um, integrating all of these tools into, um, into some domain specific workflows so that we can get our, our living um, updates um, of, uh, for a specific topic. So that's something that we're actively working on. So do get in touch. Um, but special thanks to uh, Matt Carter and Justin uh, Clark and Connor, uh, sorry, Connor Forbes um, at Bond and my uh, automation team developers and librarian um, and uh, Jing Liao, um, Shen Ying uh, and Chris uh, at Camarines who um, built the surf platform uh, from scratch uh, and have built all of these really, really cool um, plugins um, for it. So thank you very much for your time. Um, any questions?